in the sequence that is in the movie where you know uh it's right at the end and then the, all the light comes through the window and everything yeah. and that like chris said something to him and before the take and the camera was pushing in like moving down on a big kind of i think it was on a track i'm not sure but um i thought he was gonna punch <laughs> out of me like jason Clark. It, it was so, it was so outrageously aggressive he was like moving down with the camera and we were just kind of imp improvising but he was it was terrifying wow. but excellent and that's the take that's in the movie prepare your ears humans happy sad confused begins now i'm josh horowitz and today on happy sad confused well, it's a full circle moment for the podcast about seven months ago i had a guest by the name of mr killian murphy on the movie oppenheimer had not come out yet and Nearly a billion dollars, 13 Oscar nominations later. Killian's back talking Oppenheimer. It's good to see you, man. Yeah, good to be here. Good to be here. Um, it has been quite a ride. Congratulations on everything that's come since we chatted. Um, Thank you. I, 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 first of all, before we get into we're going to kind of do a little bit of a different take on um, the conversation for Happy Second Fused here. But, um, you know, I was talking to Emily Blunt recently, and she talked about the moment of seeing folks... Uh, dressed up as Oppenheimer yeah. in the theater as the moment she knew, like, okay, this is this is not a normal experience. Yes. Did you have a comparable moment in this journey? Um, there wasn't a kind of a one eureka moment like that, but I think people stopping me on the street and saying they've seen the movie four and five and six times, yeah. that has been pretty um, staggering. You know, and obviously when we began to realize that the... the kind of business that movie was doing as well it was just kind of overwhelming um and it's in the best way possible you know it, it seems to be people telling other people you have to go and see it people going to see it two or three times people seeing it in IMAX and mm -hmm. and I and uh yeah we're all still a bit re, re we're still reeling from it you know yeah who is I, I mean I know this is obviously meaningful for you but like who in your orbit is this meaningful for Are friends and family getting a kick out of the ride you've been on the last six, seven months? Oh yeah, I mean, they're all, they all think it's gas. And um, I've just been away a lot as well. I haven't seen that many people because we've kind of been on the road. Yeah. But not, people are thrilled, you know, uh, uh, um, it's wild. So um, as I said, I wanted to kind of treat this a little bit differently because we, it's rare to have a, uh, uh, it's a good sign, I will say, when you have a guest on twice for the same movie. That means someone's <laughs> doing something right. Um, but I want to kind of like uh, take a little bit of a, a step back and look at some of your notable moments in your career. Uh, I've chosen five films of yours, including Oppenheimer. Great. I'm going to point out a couple scenes. and I just want to get some reflections from you at the, the point you were at in your life and career. And we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, for those that don't know, Disco Pigs was the play that really got you yeah. started yeah. and then became the film. It wasn't necessarily the first film you shot, as I understand no. it. Um, but take me back, 2001, I believe? I think it was 2000 or 2001, yeah, okay, when we so, did it. Yeah. Okay, so you'd done the play for a while. Yeah. Now you step on a set and you have some experience on camera, but how green were you on the set of Disco Pigs, as you, as you recall? Yeah, it was pretty green, I think. I think I was 24 when I did that film, and uh, that means I would have been acting for about four years. Yeah. Um, and I was playing a 17-year-old as That's well right. at 24. But I was, I had done an awful lot of theater, and I'd started getting parts in films. But I was watching an awful lot of films. I was, that's what I would spend my time yeah. doing, was watching films and watching actors and watching performances. And I knew that we had to kind of transpose the the performance that in the film, sorry, in the on the on stage yeah. into, in, in, into the, the film. And I knew that it would involve modulating the performance because the performance on stage was was inevitably and uh, had to be big, yeah. kind of to reach the you know the back the rafters, back row, yeah, say, yeah, yeah. So I remember thinking, right, this is going to have to be a different sort of performance. But we had a great director, Kirsten Sheridan, and. And I knew the character really, really, really well. I mean, you'd played this like hundreds of times by, yeah. that, by that point. Yes, we had done the play for like 18 months on and off. So even though the script was different, but I knew the, the sort of essence of the character. 
So, and, and for those who don't know, um, this is about kind of a codependent relationship yeah. between uh, a young man that clearly is, have, has mental issues. I mean, there's yeah. some serious problems that uh -huh. he's going through, uh, and the woman that he has this very intense relationship with. Mm. Um, I rewatched it again the other night, and the scene I wanted to mention that struck that jumped out at me was about 30 minutes in. I believe it's the day after you you kiss your this woman that you're infatuated with yeah. and develop this amazing bond with. Uh, and then you have this monologue on the bed kind of talking about, oh, yeah. fantasizing a bit about yeah. her. Yeah. Do you remember that? You're shirtless, you're on a bed, and it's like a yeah. three-minute solid shot on you delivering this monologue. Yeah, I remember that because that monologue was actually verbatim from the play that was completely just lifted. And Enda Walsh, who wrote the play and wrote the film, just took that so I knew that speech like the back of my hand I had performed it for 18 months but again I knew that I had to deliver it in a different way right in a much more sort of naturalistic way if possible and I remember we we shot that uh on a stage I think and I think we took the day to do it uh, and you know like like every most days on set you feel like you haven't got it well I felt like I hadn't got it and right. Didn't think I nailed it, but um, but I remember the director was very happy. I haven't seen it in many, many, many Holds years. Up. Okay, good. it's good. <laughs> do you, I mean, do, do you, like do you still have that dialogue in your brain? Like, do you do scripts stick with you years later? The t the dialogue, the actual dialogue. Like, I mean, is Oppenheimer still in there? Is even Disco Pig still in there in some dark, deep recess of your brain? I think the plays. By the nature, just how deep it had to go in there. It's, it's yeah, in there. <laughs> and um, because you're doing it every night and yeah. sometimes twice a day, that I think they they st stay in there. But you know, I think a lot of actors were kind of like you have to clear the hard drive <laughs> to make room for the next thing. Sure. And I've never had a problem retaining lines, but I um, and I, I I can read them pretty quickly because you develop this thing. It's the I think it's the hippocampus is the part of your brain that retains all that information. Right. So I think most actors have a fairly um, well-developed hippocampus, you know. And even the volume on, on Oppenheimer, I mean, and you're, and we'll get to this in a second, yeah. but you shot that relatively quickly for how yeah. dense that script is. Yeah. You were able to absorb in that, in that rapid speed, and it's just kind of like that's, your brain is just attuned to that now. You can. It is it. now. Yeah. With Oppenheimer, I remember I learned it all, more or less all of it, in advance, wow. because I knew the insane pace that Chris would be working at. Yeah. And now, I, I, I just learned them mechanically. I didn't... Sure. They were like... You didn't assign actual emotion. There yet. was you none. Just, it was, yeah. It was just I knew the lines. Um, and because it was quite, you know, verbose, so I needed, I needed to. Yeah. I am so thrilled to say that our new sponsor on Happy, Sad, Confused is Vessi. I'm a New Yorker through and through. That means I'm walking all day long through rain, through sleet, through snow, whatever the weather is, I want something on my feet that looks good, that feels good, and that can take on whatever element is out there. That's why I am loving Vessi. Their everyday classics are the absolute answer to stylish city commuting. Their sleek design fits my professional vibe and will fit yours. It ensures that I stride in style and comfort. And Vessi's lineup, especially the everyday classic, and the Chelsea offers unparalleled comfort for all day wear. Their lightweight, breathable design means you can move through your day from work to evening walks without any discomfort. Vessi is the epitome of comfort meeting style. I'm so thrilled they're a sponsor of Happy Sad Confused because I can't think of anything more important than what I, what's on my feet because that's the trouble area. You want to be comfortable, you want to look great, and you want it just to work. Vessi's the one for you. We've got a great offer for you today, guys. Visit Vessi.com slash happy sad now and get ready to conquer any terrain and style. Plus, with that offer code, you enjoy 15% off your first order. Start your journey with Vessi today. Again, that's Vessi.com slash happy sad. Get that 15% off today. Treat your feet right. Moving on and coming relatively soon thereafter is 28 Days Later. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, of course, this is your collaboration with Danny Boyle. And as I understand it, um, he put you through the paces on the audition, in the audition process. Yes, he did. But, I mean, that's what, that's what I was going through 
all of the time there at that stage of my career was like auditioning for things and not getting things. And But I desperately wanted this one because I had a train spotting poster in my bedroom as a kid. I went to see that movie when it first came out, you know, right. the first day we were, we were all there. And similarly with uh, Shallow Grave, yeah. and, you know, uh, um, so I realized this was significant because he was a proper world-class director. Um, so I think we did, I did five or six um, auditions for that. Is that a happy day? Do you remember when you actually got the role? Yeah, I do. I was in the, I was in an airport queuing up for a Ryanair flight. <laughs> and I remember jumping up and down. The finest airline. There yeah. Is, yeah. And I was jumping up and down. <laughs> so it's hard to beat those moments, except maybe when Chris Nolan says you're going to be the lead in Oppenheimer. I would imagine that takes you back. That was another good day. Yeah. 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 So, okay, there are a bunch of scenes in 28 Days Later I could bring up. People obviously bring up the, the iconography of wandering the streets of London where it's abandoned. But another scene that, that jumped out at me is towards the end of the film um, where you kind of like go native, essentially. You kind of like you're, uh, you're, you're saving Selena. Yeah. You're burying your fingers into the eyes of, yeah. your, of the aggressor. And what struck me is also that marriage of sound the john murphy score yeah i mean seeing the finished product of that can you remember shooting it and then seeing the finished product and how that felt to you in in the before and the after of that well yeah the, the, i think the journey for the character is that uh, like he is this kind of we meet him at the beginning and he's kind of doesn't know what's happening he's com you know completely like uh at a loss yeah to figure out what's going on and he's so naive and scared and all of that and then by the end he's become this sort of killing machine you know kind of like yeah like the infected and um i remember we shot that whole sequence over three weeks and nights i remember and i was shirtless in november in england somewhere and it was rain machines and just being freezing but i remember you know danny He's so great visually. His films are always so confident visually, and I knew that it would look great if we got it, if we got it right. Um, but it was it was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> the anger was was within. You didn't have to tap into too much the frustration. And the no, it was freezing cold. <laughs> um, but just it was just br br brilliantly written, and, I, and it's an it, it, it's an amazing sequence. It's so tense. Oh my god! You know? Yeah. yeah. Do you see? Do you see? Danny is a kindred spirit with, with Christopher. They're both kind of like these, obviously cinephiles that can do kind of anything on a set, have enthusiasm in different ways about the process. Um, I don't know, is there is there a linkage you see between them at all? I, I know that they both have uh, immense respect for each other, and I know that, you know, uh, Chris saw 28 Days Later before he cast me in right. Batman Begins, and, and I know that they're a fan of each other's work. Yeah, they're just, they're, they're singular voices, you know, they really are... Uh, unique f f filmmakers and they have that same passion and energy on set when you work with them. I would expect now, given recent news, you're happy that 28 Days Later went with the ending it did, that your character survived the mm, ending. There were two days. endings. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the character lived, and I, I don't expect you to say anything, but the news is out there that finally, after all these years, Alex, Danny, and you are collaborating yeah. on, a, on a sequel. Yeah. Um, because when we spoke six, seven months ago, either you were a great actor, which you are. Like, is this recent development? Did this come together relatively recently? I mean, it's for them to speak about, I suppose. But I think it's been brewing for a while. Yeah. And, I, you know, the first movie was so important for me as an actor. And I, like, love working with those guys. And Alex ha ha has an idea. Um, That's so, kind of enough. Alex and, Garland has a good idea, yeah. then we're in, right? Yeah, and and Danny, I think Danny directing it is just you know, huge. So watch this space. You no, know, and, and again, I know we can't talk about it yet, but I, I, we talked about how SARS kind of like was of that time, and the fact that we're just lived through COVID. Yeah, it can't help but influence. I would imagine where we're going to see. I don't know. It's going to be exciting. It'll be exciting. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Well, that's a, that's for another conversation one day. Um, Batman Begins. Yeah. Okay. So I know you've talked about like work begetting work, and clearly there is. Like if we trace each of these projects to the other, they are linked, right? Yes. As you said. Um, so you were a fan of Christopher Nolan's. Yeah. You get the call. He wants to meet with you to play Batman. Yeah. You knew in your heart of hearts maybe this didn't feel right. But I, here's my question. How do you prep for an audition when you know you're going to be up for a Batman? Like do you get the sides in advance? Are you reading the comic books? Do you remember what you did to even prep for that audition? 
That's a really good question. It's so long ago. Um, I feel like we must have been given sides in and around the, the day of the shoot. We shot on the Warners a lot, I think, and everyone, like, you could see all the, I knew the other guys that were auditioning, and I knew that Christian Bale was the obvious choice, and I knew that, like, I was very, very slight physically back then, and right. I knew that I didn't have that physicality then to kind of do it. But for me, it was just to be able to get in a room yeah. with Chris for Nolan and to be able to say, oh, well, I worked with him, yeah. you know? Uh, and that was all I was looking for. Um, and there was a full, like, they'd, they'd, they'd built a set, right. and they shot it on 35, and it was... It was a big... Right, can I keep this footage? Because I just shot a film with Christopher Nolan, <laughs> technically. Well, I think it exists. I think the footage no, exists. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was it. I, I genuinely was like, yeah. lovely to meet you guys. Have a you know, good look at the movie. And then he called me a week or two later, I can't remember, and said, look, it's not going to work out. We thought it mightn't. But there's this other part. You know what's interesting? Like this kind of like house of ca like cards, or like how one thing changes something else. Is like I had Gary Oldman on oh, the yeah. podcast recently, and he talked about because I asked him about was he always up for Gordon, and he said actually, as he understands it, Chris first wanted him for Scarecrow. Oh really? <laughs> Which again, I can almost see because like it's almost a strange choice to go younger with that character. Yeah. On paper, you could see that kind of character be a little bit older, but again, opening your mind and kind of like oh wait. Maybe Gary makes more sense for this. Kill. It's just it's just fascinating how one thing leads to the other. Yeah, and I think that some like you know Chris has so many feathers to his bow as a director, but I think his skill at casting is something that people don't quite uh, talk enough about. Yeah, he, he's always been genius at casting his films, kind of in an unexpected way. Yeah, you know, uh, and he he kind of he doesn't go the conventional way with with the casting and i think it's always worked out from there there are two, two scenes in batman begins that jumped out at me when i was again rewatching it the other day for the 20th time um the scene with you and tom wilkinson is just fantastic oh, yeah. and obviously Poor old tom, yeah. a, little, a little more resonant now that yeah. we've lost the great tom wilkinson yeah. um and also i mean like in kind of like a classic comic book fashion when rachel is kidnapped you kind of take her in and batman kind of comes into the scene um it clearly like it feels like this is the kind of role where you felt some license to have some fun with it, to go big. Yeah. And like, did you feel out on a limb then? Cause you hadn't had this relationship with Chris established yet, but like, you know, your, even your elocution is very precise. You're kind of like leaning in a little bit more than, than some actors might. Um, yeah. But you felt like it, the material warranted it and, and it, it would work for this precise role. Yes. And I, I, I felt like, Right, this is great. He's just like he's an out and out villain. Yeah. You know, it's rare you get to do that and just have a bit of fun. And I remember even that reading of when I call him the Batman, and I remember doing that a bit big. Yeah. And I went and I thought he's never gonna he's never gonna use that because right. it's a bit. But he he loved it and he put it in. And, <laughs> and uh, the Batman. Yeah, it was <laughs> like I said, I'll have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. It's, and the thing I think, you know, with. Um, great directors is you just got to show them stuff yeah and they may or may not like it or they may or may not use it but if you if you show them stuff then it's there rather than just talk about it if you actually just demonstrate it you know yeah i also i love that the end of that sequence you know uh there's some really great moments of humor in that film and you get the great line dr crane isn't here right now but if you'd like to make an appointment oh yeah <laughs> just <laughs> Just works, um, and also like noted that you know all these Batman villains we see in these different incarnations, we still have never seen Scarecrow in another film, which I think you should take as a badge of honor. Oh yeah, that's right. He's yeah. I didn't I didn't think about that. Just adding to your quiver of accomplishments. Um, okay, so we could spend an hour, three hours, ten hours on Peaky Blinders, as you can imagine. You want to open up a, a Pandora's box on the internet? Ask the internet what their favorite Peaky Blinders scene is, as I did. Oh, did you? <laughs> 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 well, wow, what did you get? I got a lot. Uh, right. where, do, where do we even begin? Well, first, let's just talk about the phenomenon of Peaky Blinders, which I, I know you're very grateful for, and it means a lot to you. Um, that character, Tommy Shelby, has been immortalized on the body of Dave Bautista and many a people. You, By accident, apparently. Right? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> apparently, that's what he said. That's hysterical. Uh, yeah. Do you still see tattoos of, of Tommy every once in a while? Yep. Yep. How does that strike you when you know you, your face has been immortalized on a human being's body? I mean, it's 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 quite something, you know. <laughs> that's that's quite a level of uh, 
I don't know, uh, zeitgeistism, whatever the word is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, I've seen some amazing tats, like of really, really cool ones. Yeah. Um, so they're always be- like, I'm, I'm very impressed and honored. Would you ever consider immortalizing? I, I feel like you would go with a musician if you were going to do any kind of figure from pop culture on your body, a tattoo. Probably a musician, yeah. Right. But I don't don't ask me who. But no. Not Bowie? I feel like Bowie keeps coming up. I just buy the records, you know. <laughs> You're good to get, but I know the music. The yeah. records are enough. Yeah, they are kind of for me. <laughs> All right, so a few moments that jump out from Peaky Blinders. People, yeah. of course, talk about many wonderful scenes with Annabelle Wallace playing Grace, um, the I'll Break Your Heart, Already Broken oh, yeah. Exchange. Crazy. Do you remember reading that exchange and feeling like, oh, that's just... Heartbreaking, amazing dialogue. Great, yeah. great writing. Yeah, great writing, and uh, and really well directed. And Annabelle was great in it, and it, it was just a kind of a good scene. I remember the director cut that scene together and showed it to us and said, "I think we got something special here." Do you feel that generally in the moment now? At this point, do you have kind of like that barometer on a set, or not really? Generally, the default thing is. I could have done that better. Like, you know, could, could, could have nailed that more. There's other stuff we should have explored. That's always the way. I, I feel like if you finish a scene and you all are high fiving, that's yeah, that's a weird vibe. That's yeah. weird. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and it doesn't get it doesn't go away. It's it's the same. Yeah. You know? End of season two. Tommy thinks he's meeting his maker. People always, of course, talk about this and and that that walk away from the grave. Oh yeah. Do you remember what's going on in your brain, in Tommy's brain? How you're processing that moment? I was just in. I was just in it. You know, I can't really recall. Yeah. It's quite a while ago, but I just remember being in it. Uh, I was almost like most normal people would be relieved to not be dead. I think he was relieved. No, he was wishing that he was dead, I think. Right. You know? Yeah. So, so that was the distinction with him, I think. Um, uh, on a, a kind of a more trivial note, but, but like a, a resonant note, no fucking fighting. It's just <laughs> yeah. like the meme of all memes. Yeah. You, know, you, love a, you love a good meme, Killian. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk to me, about, do you remember like, I mean, again, rewatching that, like how much of that is in the script of kind of like how you're going to kind of roam the room and get in people's faces? Is that kind of like found on the set in terms of the physical? I remember there was a stage direction in that scene and it said, this is the angriest we've ever seen Tommy Shelby. So again, That's it gives nice. you license to yeah. go, let's, let's go for it. Uh, and it was brilliantly written and, and it was kind of, it was funny, but it was also like he meant, he meant it. <laughs> do, do you know? Yeah. Uh, we had a brilliant director for that. Series, that series, Tim Meelan, who I've just made another movie with and going to do another movie with. So we were in really great hands there, that series. And so how, again, I know we, we've joked about this in the past, like you're, you're not plugged in. This is not your world, the internet. But like when something like that travels, how aware are, are you of it that like that's become a thing on the internet? Do oh, people you, send that to you? Do you uh, see yeah, that? Like my kids show me, show me. Show yeah, me. just so you know. Yeah. So you're aware. <laughs> and it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it, it gets used in, for every uh, out of context, you know. Um, but it's just, I think that's, it's great. It's a great reflection on the show and on the writing and on the direct, direction if that stuff lands like that. You know? 100%. Yeah. This episode of Happy, Sad, Confused is brought to you by BetterHelp. Well, the new year has come and gone and it's a time of year when... We all make those resolutions, and I think a lot of people get caught up in trying to remake their life and go extreme and really just like change everything all at once when the truth is you're succeeding, you found ways to better your life. And with something like therapy and something like BetterHelp, you can find those strengths and build upon them. Instead of just wholesale changing your life, build upon what's working and ditch those extreme resolutions and make practical changes that actually stick. If you're like me, you've benefited from therapy. It has helped so many people I know, and it can help you. If you're thinking of starting therapy, I encourage you to give BetterHelp a try. Guys, it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. They make it that simple. Celebrate the progress you've already made, guys. Visit 
betterhelp.com slash HSC today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash HSC. Give BetterHelp a try today. Okay, but this brings us all uh, very quickly to Oppenheimer. Okay. okay, so Oppenheimer, I mean, again, in a three-hour movie, <laughs> there are a lot of great moments. Uh, I know one of your favorite sequences is also one of mine. Um, it's when you go toe-to-toe with Mr. Jason Clark yeah. towards the end, and yeah. it feels like suddenly we're like in like a classic, uh, I don't know, a classic play, like 12 yeah. Angry Men, yeah. like this like confrontation between uh, Rob and, and, and you, your character, Oppenheimer. Um, and this happened relatively later on in the shoot, as I understand it. This was the last two weeks of the shoot. That whole sequence, uh, that whole hearing, we shot uh, pretty much in order at the end of the movie, um, uh, which is rare enough. Yeah. Uh, and so everyone was really warmed up by then and, and, and like, we were really in it. We were all exhausted, but we were really in it. And it felt to me like we, being, like you say, piece of theater, like it felt like being a company of actors. Yeah. We were in this horrible, tiny location and everyone was squashed into that one room. But we just go in and hit it every day with those scenes. And they were, they were great. I, there were some of my, and you know, Jason Clark is such a wonderful actor. And he gave me so much stuff in that scene. In the sequence that is in the movie where, you know, uh, right at the end and then the, all the light comes through the window and everything yeah. and that like Chris said something to him and before the take and the camera was pushing in like moving down on a big kind of I think it was on a track I'm not sure but um, I thought he was going to punch the shit out of me like Jason Clark it, it, was so, it was so outrageously aggressive he was like moving down with the camera and we were just kind of imp- improvising but he was it was terrifying wow. but excellent and that's the take that's in the movie was the was the light was that practical or all that? practical yeah. Wow. yeah yeah there was a huge rig outside the window that went up yeah so yeah, yeah and uh, his physicality his bulldog energy taken off the glasses and just like tear poor, poor oppie is just like hollowed out you yeah. feel he is like a shell of a human being yeah and we just feel it depleted he's he's dead he's like dead inside by the end of that yeah scene. And the stuff that he's addressing, he, it doesn't really get addressed in any, any other part of the movie, but it's kind of the theme of the fi- of the of the film, do you know? Right. I mean? Was so, and then how like how long does that take? You say that's a couple of weeks in that room doing all the stuff in there. Like mm. th- that spe- that specific confrontation is a couple of days. Is that like? I think we were doing sections of it, you know, over yeah. and back. But that big, the big showdown probably would have been a half a day just to do wow. that because we were working at such a lick, you know, it was crazy. No, it's, it's funny. Again, Emily said the reverse. She like wanted to punch him out. Like she was yeah. like so angry. Oh with my him. god, Emily Blunt's performance in that in that sequence is one for the gods. Truly, truly. Yeah. What's it like, by the way? To go, I mean, have you learned something about like the way like Downey and Emily approached this kind of crazy process the last mm. six months of like going on this ride? Is that because I feel my sense is like you've you've like you found a way to enjoy this in your own way. And like, this isn't your natural thing. We've talked about this, but like you, I feel like you've like leaned in as much as you feel comfortable leaning into this kind of crazy part of the process. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm with a lot of great people. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Emily and Downey, like they're just the best yeah. and Chris and Emma. So I'm with really good people and it's, it's a, it's a such a joyous celebration of all the hard work and the movie. And like, again, you know, you, you, when you see the reaction f- f- from fans, from people that have watched this movie over time, uh, over and over again, like it's it's very hard not to be humbled by it all and to be very grateful. So yeah, I, I, and I think the more you do it, uh, you be, you, it's never normal, <laughs> but you become slightly more used to it. You know? Fair enough. Um, yeah, speaking of like being humbled by it, a photo just started circulating of your script, I guess, oh, right. uh, from Oppenheimer. So was this the script? That he gave you, it's it, it. You can see on it. It's it's Chris Nolan writing to you, dearest Killian, finally finally a chance to see you lead. Oh yeah, I got him to sign that at the end. So because the script is is, uh, you know, it's all annotated and like bashed up and and like everyone knows now there it's on red paper with right. black ink and, but it, it's it's to me it, it was one of the greatest screenplays I had ever read and <clears throat> I really wanted Chris to sign it for me and he wrote that lovely dedication. What do, what do your typical annotations on a script 
say? Like, what are you writing? What are your notes to yourself? Well, all sorts of different things. Can be stuff, the character stuff can be <clears throat> very basic stuff. Um, can be just thoughts I'm having. You know, some I was looking at them and some of them I can't even read because they have my handwriting so bad. I don't know what I was saying to myself. Yeah. But it's just it's just a kind of a it's a kind of a stream of consciousness sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Is the is the ultimate extension of this crazy Barbenheimer thing where you guys both succeeded in your own ways, which is fantastic, a, a win for everybody. It, it it feels right that you should be physicist Ken in Barbie too. <laughs> Are you game, Killian? I mean, now that you've said it, everyone on the internet will probably <laughs> insist on that. I'm just trying to get you work, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. But you, you have said, you know, in a more serious way, work begets work. What we talked totally. about earlier. Like, and you've gotten a chance to, like, meet and fraternize with these amazing actors and filmmakers through this process. That's been the best part, you know? That's been the best part is, like, meeting all these amazing filmmakers and, you know, chatting to, to Greta Gerwig and, like talking about her, her process and how, how she she's getting on with like all, all these great people that's just one example but just to be in a room with filmmakers and actors and is is kind of I, I never get to do that normally yeah. so. no you strip away kind of like the silly parts of it and it's like oh wait I'm with the greatest artists of our time totally. making the stuff that I yeah. love and respect this is pretty cool and uh, you know I think it's a really really strong year for cinema last year was you know so Truly. so I've really enjoyed all these movies did you since since we last spoke did you finish succession did you ever get around yeah. to it yeah are you happy with who ended up inheriting the throne very <laughs> no man I, I'm kind of devastated it's over yeah uh uh that was I adore that show what will you do the day after, after Oscars, after all of this? Have you already kind of fantasized what the day after and the week after and the month after this mad run ends? Um, yeah, just I'll return to my normal, boring <laughs> self. <laughs> That's what I'll do, um, which I'm quite happy to do. You know, I, I'm very happy to be, you know, just at home with the family. You'll be happy to know since, again, since our last conversation, uh, you're... Your nihilist approach to the iPhone uh, blank screen has affected me. I've gone dark on my iPhone. Nice. I feel, and I feel like it's soothing. It's it, it it. I understand what you're getting at. Yep. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so soon we'll just have to just dump dump them and get a, like a, a dumb phone. I can't do that. I, I know. can't go that far. I know. We're, we're, uh, I wish we're I tethered could. forever. Unfortunately, it might be. All right, we're going to end with, um, you did the profoundly random questions last time. I've got a few more for you, and we'll end on this. Okay. Um, happy, sad, confused, profoundly random questions. Um, just taste-wise, are you a Star Wars or Star Trek guy? Oh, Star Wars. Yeah. No okay. question, yeah. Okay. Empire Strikes Back the best? Star Wars? That's a controversial question. Uh, I like, yeah, the, fir the, first, the first three, they're, they're, yeah. that's, I'm that generation, you know? Yeah. They, they were, I saw them when I was a kid in the movies, yeah. yeah. Uh, James Bond or Doctor Who? James Bond. Yeah, with James Bond, I guess we didn't really have the channel, the Doctor Who growing up in Ireland didn't have those. Uh, I, I didn't have those. So Doctor Who. Okay. okay. Or sorry, James Bond, yeah. Uh, weirdest place you've been recognized? Um, oh, I don't. I, can't, I mean. It happens everywhere, doesn't it? It kind of happens everywhere. <laughs> at this, right, point, at this point in time. <laughs> it's always weird. Yeah, I get yeah, it. So. Um, movie you're embarrassed to admit you've never seen? Um, I've never seen Gone with the Wind. Mm, you're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. A little dated. Let's be honest. Yeah, that's Some what people not say. Not culturally appropriate stuff in there that's anymore. What people say. Yeah. Uh, the best karaoke song of all time is. Are you karaoke or? I have karaoke. Yeah. In the past, what would be? Gosh, I don't. I tend. I. I. I don't. I don't know, man. No. Is there an artist that you would gravitate towards when you look on the? I mean. It's in your range. I could do it. Maybe do a Thin Lizzy or something like that. Okay. okay. Um, what What bothers you on a set? What takes you out of the moment? Well, we spoke about phones. I think they should phones. be banned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they should be allowed in any workplace environment. Not not to mind a film set. Yeah. You know, I think they yeah they steal away the focus and the yeah. and the and the kind of uh, you know concentration. And finally, what's a word that you maybe overuse? What's your like go-to word that like is in your lexicon? You're like, I might need to retire that. I say sound a lot. It's an Irish thing for oh. to say, you know, he's a nice guy. He's, he's sound, you're sound. Oh, that's sound. Or also you can say sound can be thank you. Oh, 
So it works in all occasions. It's a very adaptable, useful word, yeah. Right. So, so don't take it out because that's helping you. It, it is, but I probably overuse it. I feel like I, I didn't even know this, Leon. You're, you're too hard on yourself oh, always. You're sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you to know, uh, first of all, I so appreciate your time always. This is this is the 10th anniversary of Happy Sad Confused. You're uh-huh. my 10th anniversary guest, 10 uh-huh. years in. It feels very appropriate that we're having the great Killian Murphy on, not once but twice, for this astounding film. Um, I'm so happy for you, man, and I'm so happy it's gotten given us a chance to connect a few times. Thank you, as always, oh, for the time. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here on the 10th anniversary. I appreciate it, man. All right, I'll see you. Uh, get some rest after the Oscars. You've earned it. Thanks, man. All right, see you soon. Sound. Sound. <laughs> and so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>